so I'll, I'll just get started. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so to start off, I've got some questions about some of your research topics. Um, so the first question that was sent in is, can you just simply explain how do you make a vaccine? What's, how do you, you know, what's the process? Where do you get started? Yep, happy to explain. So there's kind of a, a series of kind of processes involved in taking a vaccine from you know concept all the way to clinic, as we like to say. So the first bit is usually to pick your disease. So this could be a, a disease that you theorize could cause a future pandemic or a disease that, you know, we've been trying to solve for a very long time. And either we don't yet have a vaccine or we don't have a successful vaccine and we need to make a better one. Then the second step, once you pick your disease, is to pick what part of it you want to include in your vaccine. So usually our body, when we're infected by diseases, um, recognises certain parts of those diseases, be they bacteria or viruses, usually bits on the outside. And so what we can do is we can pick those bits um, that we think might be interesting or might possibly work, um, and we can include those in our vaccine. So for some things like viruses, they're usually quite simple, so you don't have too much choice. But for kind of bigger, more complex organisms, things like parasites, um, it's a lot harder to pick exactly which one. So sometimes they don't work and sometimes you have to try lots of different options. Um, then when you've kind of picked that, you pick your technology that you're going to use for the vaccine. So most universities or companies will have their own preferred type of, of technologies, um, but essentially they're all worth trying because for some diseases, some work and again, some don't. So it's always a bit of trial and error to see what's the best option. Um, sometimes you get lucky and they all work. Um, the kind of next step then is to take your uh, potential your vaccine you've designed into testing. So you can test it first in animals and then in humans and research in humans usually goes through multiple stages. So we call clinical trials and they have what we call clinical trial phases, which you go increasing complexity, increasing numbers, and that gives you an idea if your vaccine works in people. And then finally, when you've got all that data to show that your vaccine potentially works, um, you get a license um, by presenting your data to kind of uh, regulators and then hopefully you can roll it out to the whole world. So obviously vaccines have been in the news a lot lately because of the pandemic. Um, so one student asked, how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted your research and kind of, yeah, kind of the field of vaccine research as a whole? Yeah, so I think in, in the field of vaccine research, I think one of the obviously major things is this increased awareness about the work we do. So I think if you ask most people now, they kind of know what a vaccine is. I mean, I, I do a lot of uh, kind of engagement um, and I mean, primary school kids as, as young as three or four um, even um, know roughly pretty much what a vaccine is. Um, so that's been great. It's obviously nice to have awareness of that. But people also know a bit more about the kind of technology we used. And particularly if you take the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that we developed, um, that vaccine technology wasn't really well known before the pandemic. And the same for the RNA vaccines that are used by Pfizer and Moderna. And now that technology is better understood, um, as well as kind of other older techniques for making vaccines. And I think that's really, really good. Um, I think in terms of the general impact, um, it has improved um, investment in vaccines and vaccines research. Um, but again, um, I think what you can kind of say in that regard is we did have some, well, I mean, had some really good early promise, but essentially other things kind of got in the way of some of that investment. Um, and so, you know, things like the, the Ukraine war and, and things like that. Governments, for example, have put their money elsewhere when we still would argue that you know, vaccines are still very important to invest in, in the future. Um, I also think there's a bit more understanding now of how vaccines are made and where they're made and that kind of process. Um, and that's something that, again, I think that we still can educate people more on and provide more information and be a lot more transparent on the way that vaccines are made um, and, you know, who who makes them and who benefits from that process. Yeah, so you've talked a bit about some of the different technologies that are available for making vaccines. So one student asked, what do you think are kind of the most promising new developments in vaccine development? Like what kind of things should we be excited about in the future? So obviously there's lots of research into new vaccines and things like that for many of the infectious diseases that people you know, know about. We've got some really promising um, results potentially coming out soon about our malaria vaccine that we've been working on here in Oxford for the last 20, 25 years. Um, that's really exciting. But I think in terms of the future and almost quite a novel approach is, you know, people are starting to look into vaccines for things that aren't for infectious diseases. So, for example, there are neurological conditions, things like Parkinson's and MS, multiple sclerosis, where people are starting to find um, information that leads, indicates maybe some sort of diseases and other things like that actually at downstream can lead to these diseases. And actually, by developing vaccines, we might actually be able to treat 
these types of diseases as well. This also applies to cancer. There's lots of potential cancer vaccines um, that are being developed. And again, this is an alternative to some of the other kind of therapeutics that are available. So I think we're kind of getting to that point where the technology developed for vaccines can be applied to the kind of wider area of kind of um, health and, and health research, which is really, really exciting. Yeah. Um, and so I suppose leading from that, we've talked about maybe some of the opportunities, but what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in developing these new vaccines um, and how how are you looking to overcome those? Yeah, so I mean, obviously there's, I mean, there's been challenges in vaccine development, as I said, some diseases are incredibly complicated. You look at diseases like HIV, um, now that's probably the most well invested in um, disease for vaccine development there is, um, even more so than COVID over the span of the last couple of decades. Um, and we're still not that close to having a HIV vaccine, even though there's some promising um, kind of data and research. Um, so there's still a lot to do. Um, there's still always going to be some really difficult diseases. Um, and obviously, um, one of the other challenges is identifying future diseases. So, you know, we've been working on other coronavirus vaccines, things like MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, before COVID hit us. Um, and that would give us a really good kind of uh, like leg up when it came to starting that vaccine program. But in the future, we may not, might not be so lucky. So really, realistically, we need to be start preparing for lots of different eventualities and hopefully that will be really useful. Um, as I mentioned, investment investment still is a big challenge. Um, obviously, we've, we're very keen to encourage governments to invest in vaccine development, but realistically, you probably need a lot, for, a lot more money from philanthropy um, and donors and things like that. Um, and just convincing people that, that that work we're doing is incredibly important for the kind of more global population. And finally, for, for me, one of the biggest um, challenges is making sure that in the future, vaccines get to everyone we need. So one of the things we found um, during the pandemic was this problem of kind of vaccine equity. You know, we made vaccines, we tried to make them available for everyone, but generally most ended up in wealthier countries and not in places like Africa and, and poorer countries around the world. I think that's one thing that Oxford um, and our vaccine, we did very well because that was always our intent. And we had that agreement with um, AstraZeneca when we licensed the vaccine that, you know, we want to make sure our vaccine does get to the poorest people. And we have that freedom as an academic institution. But I think in the future, hopefully everyone should be applying uh, to that kind of idea. And there are lots of different ways that we can kind of do that. Um, and I think in terms of like, for example, manufacturing, we need people all around the world to be make, making their own vaccines. So ideally, you'd invest in vaccine development in Africa, or in Southeast Asia, or in South America, or North America. Um, and, and that means everyone can make vaccines for themselves. And that gets rid of that issue of people hoarding and keeping vaccines when ideally everyone should have equal access. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really interesting because like when I thought we'd be talking about vaccines here, I thought we'd be you know, like focused on science, but it's actually a much bigger problem, isn't it? It's kind of economics and politics and everything. It very much is, and, and that's actually a changing approach to the way that the university deals with it. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, historically, uh, I've worked in vaccine research from the point of view of, of, of actually making it and testing it and doing the science, the lab immunology, understanding my kind of PhD was in understanding the body's response to malaria vaccines. Mm -hmm. But a new approach, we've got the new Pandemic Sciences Institute, which I've moved across to and I'm working in. And that's all about multidisciplinary approach. And so it's about kind of bringing together people who work in the politics, people who work in the manufacturing, people who work in um, monitoring disease mm -hmm. and having that kind of pipeline that when you know, we get a new pandemic, everyone's working along the same lines. And that hopefully can improve the kind of outcomes. Yeah, really exciting. Um, so. Obviously, the, the audience of this interview are kind of students, young people. Um, so I have some questions kind of about people who maybe want to study something in this field or some questions about future careers as well. Um, so one question sent in was what kind of skills do students need to be a successful scientist and how can they kind of begin to develop these skills while they're still at school? Yeah, so I think that's a really, really important question and something that comes up. But I think people tend to think along one line where as my answer will be kind of a, a bit more of a broader approach. So obviously there's plenty of individual skills that are incredibly important if you're going into a kind of career in you know, science research and academia. So things like critical thinking, coming up with original ideas that you can obviously test, um, and also problem solving skills. But as we've kind of seen in the pandemic, this, uh, I mean, you know, when we had that kind of um, the response that was needed, um, and you look at our kind of own research area, there were hundreds and hundreds of scientists working together. Now, you don't need in those circumstances every single one of them to be the people coming up with the original ideas. 
you've got the senior people doing that, and then you've got the supporting cast. So actually things like teamwork, um, time management, um, and you know, communication skills are, are equally important because you know we could have done all this work if we couldn't communicate it with the public, there would be no one in the public who have, would have faith in the work we're doing. Um, so all those things are equally important. And I always kind of say, you know, the supporting cast is, is, is important um, to this process as the kind of leading star. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's a place for everyone. And there's also quite a diverse range of careers. You know, you could go into things like biology, biochemistry, medicine, which probably makes up most of the scientists. Mm -hmm. But you've equally got, you know, finance people who are in charge of the kind of man managing uh, project management and stuff as well. And people who monitor all the stuff behind the scenes. Um, and even for people like IT, IT services and things really are incredibly important. Things like cybersecurity, we never had to thought we had to deal with before the pandemic, but obviously with the increased interest in our work, that was something that was really, really necessary. Um, so those are kind of the broader things. Um, I'd also kind of say that, you know, your personal interests and just doing what you are interested in is just as important as the process as building up these skills. Um, you know, in terms of like leadership skills and things like that, I would say, you know, taking part in sport is, is, a, is a great way. Uh, captaining sides shows leadership and things like that. It doesn't always have to be academic. Um, and also there's a role for things outside of science. So even if you're interested in going into a career in science, um, from my experience, there's some useful skills that you can kind of apply. I actually studied history in A-level and I thought that was very useful for kind of writing and, and coming up with uh, different arguments. Um, I mean, for example, um, being able to communicate um, if you're interested in drama and things like that, now a lot of my work is actually involved in science communication. That type side of thing is, is quite useful. But also things like languages. I actually, in my kind of previous role, I was running some studies um, across Africa and I was working in both Ghana, which is English speaking, but also Burkina Faso, which is French speaking. So I don't speak French. I'm terrible at languages. So very much from that experience, I learned the benefit of having a colleague who did speak uh, French and was almost acting as a translator. Um, and that's incredibly important. So, you know, you need to have people kind of doing all these things. Um, mathematicians, is, in, for example, is incredibly intelligent because a lot uh, it's incredibly useful because, you know, not everyone can understand the detailed maths. So most scientists will work with statisticians and mathematicians to help them along the way. So if you're that way inclined, uh, you can go into maths and then have a side interest. And that can be a really, really useful uh, kind of career thing. Um, and also, I mean, like I said, for me, my route was pretty typical, pretty much most of the way through my career. Um, I kind of, you know, uh, went, I was interested in science, I studied biology, I did an undergrad bi uh, in biology here in Oxford, then worked as a research assistant. So one thing to kind of note with careers wise, you don't have to go straight from doing an undergraduate into doing kind of further studies, you can go and work and get some experience. And that will teach you if you want to kind of, for example, go into the lab and do that side of research. Um, I benefited quite a lot from that and had a very easy uh, and kind of um, well organized PhD. Um, I had a very good supervisor. Picking a good supervisor is very, very key to kind of anything. I mean, liking your boss and getting on with your boss is incredibly useful, whatever career you get into. So um, I would definitely say the same is, is relevant for science. So but it's important to note that, you know, it's not a linear route. Um, you can change. As I said, I saw my route very much going through academia and staying in academia, progressing through to being a lead scientist and things like that. But on the back of the pandemic, I took a change of route into kind of science communications and public engagement, and um, I've never looked back. So uh, I really enjoy doing something that's a bit different. Um, and yeah, there are ways of moving parallel to what you might think is the typical route of an, of an academic. Um, also worth considering there's industry. So I mean, academia and industry now are working together more than ever. Um, and there's lots of ways of kind of working between the two. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear about kind of the wide range of roles available. And I was also looking down my question list and I think you answered like the next three questions. <laughs> but just to kind of maybe just to finish off. So you've talked a lot about the skills that, you know, are useful and so many different applications for different, you know, areas of study. Um, but kind of what, where do you see the future heading? So what's kind of the future of vaccine development? Um, what kind of breakthroughs maybe you're hoping to see? Um, and will that affect the kind of skills that maybe students need if they want to pursue roles in this area of research? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I think um, <clears throat> I kind of mentioned things like IT and modelling could be incredibly important in the future. I mean, 
there's always going to be a role in in kind of vaccine research and you know hands-on science that you're going to need people to run assays a lot of them are too complex for um to be run by things like robots but we do use a lot of robots for example increasingly in the lab uh, to increase the throughput so for high throughput science it means you can do a lot in a very short amount of time but you know you need to be able to understand science and be able to kind of apply that to the kind of um processing um, that's needed for kind of these type of um, new IT things. Um, I think it's very important, I think, and in, in, in a future area of medicine in particular, is this idea of, you know, individualized medicine. Um, so, you know, for things like gene therapy, which is obviously um, repla like replacing essentially missing genes, for example, to cure things like blindness and other blood conditions. Um, but we can also use individual therapy in, you know, in, uh, for example, cancer treatments. And that's definitely an area of science that's obviously incredibly exciting and there's a lot of scope for, um, you know, expanding different ideas and trying different things. Um, but it's obviously at the moment that's very much limited to kind of, you know, Western countries and particularly wealthier countries. I think, you know, how we expand and learn, we can actually indiv potentially individualize this idea of like vaccines, for example. So by understanding how different populations respond differently to different vaccines or different diseases, you know, we could actually potentially tweak little bits of, of, of vaccines to make a vaccine much better for a certain genetic population to another. So that, that's and something that could potentially be done without having that ridiculously expensive cost that you need for having a single vaccine for a single person. But just understanding how people are different, also people are similar, um, can really, really help um, in that regard. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, that idea of previously of kind of these vaccine equity. So I think um, in the future, I really do hope that there's um, not only um, kind of cross talk and a lot more collaboration internationally, but, you know, manufacturing in different countries. And, and we talk about obviously students here in the UK. Um, I really hope that you, your students, if you're thinking about career in science, will get the opportunity to work with other scientists in places like Africa and Southeast Asia and South America. Um, because in my experience, you know, they're very, but we're all very, very similar in terms of our career aspect, um, aspirations and, uh, and things like um, that. And there are some brilliant sciences everywhere. And actually by working together, we will achieve a lot more than just kind of keeping to ourselves. And so I hope that can translate to every level of science and vaccinology in the future. Um, well, that's all the questions I've got. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and thank you to all the students who sent in questions too. That's right, you're welcome.